Hey, what's going on, A-Pushers? Welcome back to video number 51, the first one from period 8. This one is on the Cold War. We're going to cover everything you need to know about the Cold War in this video. Before we begin, I have to give a shout out to Coach Kavnar's class at East Limestone High School. Best of luck this year. Thanks for your support. You guys will do great in May. All right, so let's start talking about the origins of the Cold War. Well, with the end of World War II, differences between the U.S. and USSR heightened, specifically the differences in government styles. In the Soviet Union, you have communism and a dictatorship, whereas you have democracy in the United States. And I like to begin this unit with a quote that I often give my students, and that is, is the enemy of your enemy your friend or your enemy. So both the U.S. and the Soviet Union had a common enemy during World War II. That was the Nazis. Now, just because they have a common enemy, does that automatically make them friends? And the answer we'll see is no, at least long term during the Cold War. The U.S. is going to seek to contain communism or keep it from spreading. And this idea came about due to this guy, George Kennan, who is known as the father of containment. This is such an important topic Please star, circle, underline, highlight this bad boy. He wanted to keep communism from spreading. Now, I want you to think of communism as water in a bottle. So without this cap on top, if you tip this bottle upside down, communism will spread. So the U.S. is going to institute a series of policies that represent the cap that will keep communism or this water from spreading around the world. That's the central idea of containment. So let's discuss the Iron Curtain. This is a fictional line that divided communist Europe from non-communist Europe. Sometimes people get this confused with the Berlin Wall. It is not the Berlin Wall. This is not real. This is a fictional line that was articulated by Winston Churchill in his famous speech in 1946. So basically, we have one side of Europe that's non-communist over here in blue, and the other side of Europe that is communist in red. And we'll get to Berlin later, located in East Germany, and we'll discuss that more in a future video. So the U.S.'s foreign policy during this time was based on collective security. Things like the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, which saw an attack on one country was an attack on all. This was a collective agreement between the U.S. and many other countries that if one of them was attacked by the Soviet Union or any other communist nation, then it will be as if all of them were attacked. International aid also played an important role. You have the Marshall Plan, which provided billions of dollars to Europe to rebuild these war-torn nations, and the Truman Doctrine, which gave $400 million in military aid to Greece and Turkey. So these are two ways that the U.S. hoped to stop the spread of communism by giving money to countries to rebuild after World War II and make communism less appealing. Finally, economic institutions were created, such as the IMF, or the International Monetary Fund. This was created in 1944 that helps promote trade and provided loans to countries in need. So how did the U.S. hope to contain communism? Well, we'll see it in military engagements in Korea and Vietnam, and we'll talk about those two wars in particular more in future videos. And this really lines up with the domino theory, this fear that if one country fell to communism, then surrounding countries would as well. So the U.S. is going to try to keep as many countries as it can from becoming communist. There's also this idea of massive retaliation introduced by Secretary of State John Foster Dulles, which is that the U.S. would respond with more force if attacked. I like to call this the Ron Burgundy approach, where, you know, that kind of escalated quickly here, where if the U.S. is attacked, they basically would respond with 10 times the force that they were just attacked with. The space race is also instrumental during this time. In the beginning, it was the Soviet Union that was leading this when they launched Sputnik and had the first astronaut in space, Yuri Gagarin. And after this, the U.S. is going to build up its space program and spend a ton of money on education in the United States. And ultimately, the U.S. will win the space race with the moon landing in 1969. So military confrontation and detente throughout the Cold War. We're going to see a shift between the two of these. In October of 1962, we have the Cuban Missile Crisis in which the U.S. discovered that there were nuclear weapons in Cuba just 90 miles off the shore of Florida. And for 13 days, this was the closest the U.S. and the USSR ever came to war. They basically were stirring each other down, waiting for the other to act first. Fortunately for the U.S. and the world, 
the Soviet Union agreed to withdraw the missiles from Cuba. Detente is easing of tensions between the two superpowers. So this is kind of a thawing of the Cold War. And we see this in treaties such as SALT, the Strategic Arms Limitation Talks or treaties, which began with Nixon's administration towards the end of the Vietnam War. We'll talk more about detente then and continued through Carter's. And here you see Carter and the Soviet Union leader Brezhnev signing a treaty to limit certain arms or weapons. So post-war decolonization is going to have an impact on the Cold War. As many countries in Asia, Africa, and the Middle East became independent after World War II, the U.S. and the Soviet Union will seek allies among these new nations. For example, the U.S. immediately recognized Israel upon its creation in 1948. It was within, I think, five hours Harry Truman recognized this new country. Many revolutions, as we'll see, throughout the world were often seen as pawns of the Soviet Union. So anytime there's a revolution or somebody who had socialist ideas or communist ideas, the U.S. began to think it was a pawn of the Soviet Union and they would get involved. And many of these countries, however, remained non-aligned. They didn't really side with either the U.S. or the Soviet Union. So the Cold War in Latin America, according to the curriculum, it states the U.S. would often support non-communist regimes with varying levels of commitment to democracy. It's important to note when we're talking about the Cold War, the U.S. will support countries with varying levels of commitment to democracy or not very democratic countries as long as they were not communist. That's the big idea to take away from this unit. So we see this in Guatemala in 1954. The U.S. is going to overthrow the elected leader Arbenz in Guatemala. He was democratically elected and he nationalized land owned by the American company, the United Fruit Company. This, is a, this was a banana company. And when he nationalized or took the land from this company, the U.S. got involved and overthrew him and replaced him with the milita military dictator Armas. All right, let's do a quick recap. What is containment? Make sure you know George Kennan. The U.S. foreign policy after World War II was based on collective security, international aid, and economic institutions. Be sure you can give examples of each of those. Cold War fluctuated between direct and indirect confrontation and detente. Impact of the Cold War on decolonization and then the Cold War in Latin America. All right, guys, thanks for watching. Look forward to seeing you back here for video number 52, The Korean War. Thanks for watching as always. Best of luck on all your exams, especially the one in May, and have a good day.